Women comprise just over 6% of the U.S. Congress and less than 20% of the state legislatures. Of the 100 seats in the U.S. Senate, only two are held by women. Dianne Feinstein, California candidate for the U.S. Senate, has said, 2% may be okay for milk, but it's not okay for the U.S. Senate. <laughs> 1992 is being touted in politics as the year of the woman. Because of many factors, women are running for public office in record numbers. The National Women's Political Caucus is a strong supporter of this trend and in many ways has acted as a catalyst for this change. The NWPC is the only multipartisan grassroots organization focused solely on getting women elected and appointed to public office, specifically pro-choice women who support and promote issues of concern to all women and families. Harriet Woods, president of the National Women's Political Caucus, is with us today to discuss this rising trend of women running for political office and what it will take for them to get elected. A former newspaper reporter and television producer, Harriet's political positions have included Missouri Lieutenant Governor, State Senator, State Transportation Commissioner, and two-time Democratic nominee to the U.S. Senate. She is also a former fellow of the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. We owe a special thank you to the Oregon Women's Political Caucus for making Harriet's appearance here today possible. Please join me in welcoming Harriet Woods to the City Club. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. It, it is fun for me to be here. The reputation has preceded you, or whatever that phrase goes, because the City Club is is broadcast loud and clearly, but also uh, beyond the immediate airwaves. We know about you, and, and the invitation is a great chance for me to, to share some facts, perhaps uh, some humor. Uh, I often expect people to say, uh, 1992, the year of the woman's political rev uh, revolution, you know, fact or fiction, or something like that. Because we've had so many election cycles when we said, this is the year when women are going to win, and then, you know, something happens. But um, I want to say I'm delighted to be in Oregon, the state where women are leaders. I appreciate very much a letter I received from the governor, Governor Barbara Roberts, saying she regretted she couldn't be here and saying some nice things about our efforts to advance women. Uh, and of course, I, I would not be doing my duty if I didn't uh, recognize a couple of people here. Elizabeth First, where are you? <laughs> Elizabeth First. <laughs> and Vera Katz. Vera, stand up. <laughs> I may mention you again. I don't know. Anything to get women elected. Uh, I want to say to you that usually when I'm uh, introduced, people say, you know, twice nominee for the uh, U.S. Senate from Missouri. I was the Democratic nominee. Now I'm in my bipartisan clothing. But um, they often say, because of what's happened this year, and in 1982, she was the Democratic nominee against Jack Danforth. Uh, and when the hearings were going on with um, the famous Judiciary Committee hearings last fall where uh, Clarence Thomas was up for, uh, was for, up for confirmation as uh, a member of the Supreme Court. As many of you are aware, uh, Senator Danforth was his chief sponsor, in fact, had mentored him throughout his career. And so people were coming up in this very crowded room and, you know, sort of patting me on the back and saying, oh, Harriet, if you had just won that election, you know, we wouldn't have Clarence Thomas. And I had a real guilt trip on me. <laughs> then, you know, the, the hearings were over, and we know this from subsequent events. What a galvanizing event that was, how it mobilized women and candidates and money. And so I'm saying to everyone, you ought to thank me for throwing that race. <laughs> But I do want to talk to you about this strange year, and is it fact or fiction, and what will happen? I have to say to you, it, it's, um, I want to come here and say, and take all the credit. I, I was elected president of the National Women's Political Caucus 
almost exactly a year ago, in July of 1991, having made a difficult decision to um, leave a, an institute that I had started at the University of Missouri-St. Louis to help develop a leadership decision-making in a new style in state legislatures around the country and to work on advocacy for low-income housing And after I left the lieutenant governor position in Missouri. Uh, but I had this sense, ESP, whatever it is, that this was the year that I might indeed be able to pay back. And I now have this role as the, as literally the only head of a national women's organization who has held office or run for it. And when I came in to lead the caucus, which indeed is the premier group that puts the women into the political pipeline from the grassroots up, and you all ought to be very aware of what's going on here in the caucus in, in Oregon. But when I joined it, it was very easy for me therefore to have this mission of saying we must use all our resources. In fact, we must redirect the women's movement from the outside advocacy, as important as that is, to putting all our resources in, and putting women inside so they fully share power so that they are part of the decision making. And we are not going to use a dollar for anything else. Well, that was easy to say, of course. It was last July. Uh, we knew 1992 would, was an important election year. And indeed, uh, our group, along with a couple of the other women's groups that are electorally oriented, did a, a national survey which produced um, a report called Winning with Women that said, surprise in a way to all of us, that a woman was really the best candidate for either party in 1992. It was sort of the first survey that showed that something was happening in contrast to the past. Uh, and we had a press conference, and this is the point of this story, and, and there were the banks of reporters, and they were all saying, yeah, we know you say women are going to win this year, but you always say women are going to win this year. What's so different? And we trotted out the findings of the survey, which were really the first inklings of what I think has become now kind of a standard uh, response. And that was people, of course, were just fed up with business as usual. They saw government as deadlocked and dithering, unable to come to any solutions, even when there was consensus in the country. You know, everyone in the country said, we've got to have a health care policy. Well, nothing was happening. And they saw women as problem solvers. And more than that, problem solvers with integrity at a time when not only was government not getting anything done, but what it was getting done was not always something that anyone wanted to read in the paper in terms of scandal and mishandling of funds and obvious mismanagement of the administrative uh, apparatus of the Congress itself. And so there was, first of all, this appetite for change for the outside. I mean, this has become so boring that you may say, well, we hear that all the time. But in last fall, it sounded pretty refreshing. The second was the shift from the Cold War to the domestic agenda. Again, we all are aware of this, but I want to tell you that this is a tremendous change in terms of the opportunity for women to stand forth on a level playing field. When I ran for United States Senate in 1982, I can tell you that the test for a nominee for United States Senate was whether you could stand up to the Soviet Union, could a woman be you know, trusted to put her finger on the button? Could she shoot off the missiles? Would she uh, be sure to appropriate enough money for the military, et cetera? And so uh, there was an, uh, almost a 10 to 15% disadvantage of people said, I just don't think I could vote for a woman for senator. There also was, weirdly now, we'd have to say, um, a, a viewpoint among the voters that for a woman to go to the Senate, well, I don't know whether she would be accepted inside the club. That was 1982. In 1992, people are saying, I don't want anyone who would be accepted inside the club. <laughs> the, third, the third factor we discovered was, of course, that there was going to be unusual opportunity. It's a redistricting year. And, uh, as it happens, you know, we always talk about that and it sounds so technical to everyone but you. I know you, you folks in the City Club do a lot of issue research, but for most people that sounds a very dry topic indeed. But reapportionment in this country with the shift of population meant there's seven new seats in California, four new seats in Texas, four new seats in Florida. 
those happen to be areas where a lot of women have positioned themselves where the political climate is such that not only is it very good for women, but very good for a diversity of women, that is women of color, Hispanic, women, uh, black women, others. Uh, so that you had opportunity, uh, even unexpected opportunity with an unusual number of retirements, and matched to that a pool of women who now have begun to work their way up after 20 years, and I will credit the caucus among other groups, of doing the trainings and helping women to become city council, county, judge, whatever it is, legislature, that work their way up. So we had a, a more opportunity for women to run on the same basis without always having to be challengers, and I don't care male or female, it's hard to run against incumbents, and we know that story. Well, those were all very good things, and we also showed that there was a swing vote over the abortion issue, that women would cross lines, and so would some, some men in terms of voting for a woman who was uh, pro-choice. Well, this was, this was all very interesting, and we were recruiting candidates on the basis of that, and I would love to say to you that that's what did it, but that was, uh, that was September. October was, of course, the Hill-Thomas hearings. And I want to uh, go into that a little bit, and maybe we'll have some questions later, because I think that's still something people don't quite understand, the impact that has had on this election year and what has turned out to be a year in which women have a great chance to be elected in greater numbers than ever before. It, and, I, and I think it really went through three stages. Uh, I came on the scene, as I say, just as this drama was beginning to unfold. And the initial issue, if you can, anyone can remember it or not, was, this, was simply the issue was Clarence Thomas qualified to go on the Supreme Court. And um, a lot of the questions back and forth revolved around his, uh, his positions as stated previously on legal matters or court cases, uh, his uh, personal background. There were questions in terms that some of us tried to raise in terms of his positions on sex discrimination, et cetera. But uh, the first set of hearings were really, uh, were a huge number of people on both sides, but pretty much um, women were isolated as a special interest group onto a couple of panels. In fact, I can remember there was one panel which was sort of the legal expert panel on these discrimination, and then on the very last day was sort of the last, let's get all the rest of them on the same panel. And it was myself and the feminist majority and now and AAUW and the black women's health agenda. I mean, it was the most incredible diversity you can imagine. And I can recall um, uh, testifying to that committee because of our special mission saying, you know, the reason why this is important to women is because we, unfortunately, although we are more than half the population, are underrepresented in making the decisions, and so we have to use the courts. We have to petition very often for redress. It's very important who's on the courts to us. And uh, you know, it was sort of like, well, that's an interesting point, but that's not really what we're here about. Well, then you know what happened. The uh, whole Anita Hill allegation, uh, the sudden focus was how serious was sexual harassment. And had a male committee simply ignored and not taken seriously, there was an explosion, a really spontaneous wave washed over the Capitol. And so the second stage of the hearings really was a whole controversy over the issue of, of uh, the allegations themselves, were they true or not, how serious was sexual harassment, should there be expert witnesses or not, there sure should have been, but there weren't, et cetera. It was then the third stage that I'm really interested in. And that is something I think there is considerable misunderstanding. Uh, because the third stage was really, I think, a, um, an eye-opening emotional experience with a lot of people who suddenly saw who their government was and how it operated. It, was, it evolved into a question of who is making these decisions in this country? I mean, this is a political circus. Who is up there? Why, it's a bunch of these white old men, pardon me, but you know, it's like all these guys, it was all these guys in dark suits, white shirts, and ties, and, and everyone saying, who, who by and large don't read the papers much on political stuff. Uh, you know, they, they hardly ever watch anything except a major dramatic event, and suddenly, uh, riveted, because that's about all there is on television, it's on prime time, they are seeing this spectacle up there, and they are saying, is that, no wonder we're in such trouble in this country. And what women were saying was, no wonder we have so little support for our stretched and stretched lives. Here we are, 
uh, balancing jobs and household management and caretaking and all these things. And, and in effect, instead of getting support, we're getting the back of the nation's hand. And look what the nation is. I mean, they're the guys that are making the decisions. So it wasn't really a question of whether they agreed or not with Anita Hill or even whether everyone was convinced who was telling the truth. Uh, constantly people are saying to me, well, women weren't upset because afterwards there was a poll that showed that women uh, thought that Thomas should be confirmed. My own reaction, and I don't want to go much farther with it, is I think people thought the whole thing was a mess and why should he be any more victimized by, by anyone else? But what they did come away with was a real feeling of frustration and fury about who was making decisions and feeling in a way it became to symbolize the need for change in this country. For many of us then, was, this, was the, uh, the uh, concern whether this would last. For those of us who wondered whether it would benefit women who were running for office, was this just a seething lava underneath that had erupted and would subside and that would be the end of it? And for the, us in the caucus, we began immediately to try to find a way to make a connection. Uh, in what was a, a kind of a risk-taking leap, we ran a national ad in the New York Times which showed uh, a drawing of um, 14 women <laughs> instead of 14 men as the Judiciary Committee and said, what if? And said, you know, maybe that's unfair too to have all women instead of all men, but how bad for this country, how unfortunate for this country, not just terms in sexual harassment, but education, health care, so many other decisions that we don't have a more equitable uh, representation in government. In effect, we said, you know, turn your anger into action, join us, let's elect some women. And, and it was just an incredible response. And other groups, other organizations which reached out had the same uh, impact. But more than that, what we saw what were some women in this country who were trying to make a decision whether to run for office, who were trying to decide whether it was worth the risk to take on what is incredible challenge of running for uh, major power positions, who were, came to a final resolution. And certainly one of the chief ones was Carol Mosley Braun. For some of us, there was real anger that at those hearings, men who, yes, had been very supportive of our issues even, let us down that they didn't understand what was going on, that this was something that touched a sense of powerlessness that pervades many women's lives, whether it has been actually being physically harassed or simply frustrated in their ability to move ahead and not ever being able to do anything about it because there's always someone who preempts, who prevents you from having redress. And so um, there was a question, what would happen well, there was this outpouring of money and mobilization on behalf of women candidates. And there were some of us who said, you know, there are people there who have to pay a price. They were elected with the gender gap and they let us down. And we may not beat them, but they're going to know that if you do that, you're gonna pay a price. And obviously, the first one was Alan Dixon in Illinois. He happened to be a Democrat. There was a notion that no one would challenge him, particularly those of us in the women's movement or in the women's organizations. They were wrong um, because there was a feeling there was even more reason why he should never have cast that vote for Clarence Thomas. Um, in any case, of course, Carol Mosley Braun did step forward. Uh, I remember going up there early to help her uh, at a time when she couldn't get any press coverage and no money, and I, I, I'm not trying to make a, a big story for myself, but to, to show you how this story crept up on us. She was in a three-way race. It was, uh, as every race is, uh, a, a unique situation. In that case, there were two uh, macho men spelling, spending millions to chew one and up, the other up on television, and Carol Mosley Braun put together a marvelous coalition of women and um, people of color and a lot of other people who were dissatisfied uh, and uh, almost unnoticed, uh, of course, finally won that election. But what was very significant, it was the first manifestation that something else had happened in this country. And that is the change from the gender gap that was a gender issue gap to a gender gender gap. 
And let me explain that to you. We've often heard about the gender gap. And basically what that is is that women, at least noticeably since 1980, have voted differently than men and that they have preferred candidates who are better on domestic issues, whether they are men or women. That has tended marginally to favor the Democrats. Well, um, in 1992, something happened. It was no longer, and I think largely because of the Judiciary Committee, in the case of Illinois, women of both parties marched into that polling booth and said, where are the women's names? It wasn't just Carol Mosley Brown. It was the first woman nominated to the state Supreme Court. It was women nominated up and down the ticket to state legislative seats. And I think um, it also encouraged other women to feel that the support network, which sometimes had been lacking, and as someone who ran in 1982, I can tell you women were not always voting for women, nor certainly were they writing checks. <laughs> So we're very pleased that in 1992 they are. Lynn Yackel in Pennsylvania saw that happen. Uh, she at one point had planned to help Specter run because he was pro-choice. <laughs> and instead of that, of course, she filed to potentially, and actually now, to be his opponent in Pennsylvania as the United States Senate candidate. And we went in to help her. And all across the country, we found that um, uh, women were emboldened, heartened, uh, feeling uh, the support system to say uh, that we will help to offer change from the status quo. What is particularly significant in the case of Lynn Yackel, and then I'll, I'll move on to some final observations, was that her appeal and her message was not just to women. It was to show the Judiciary Committee, uh, a, a clip from the Judiciary Committee hearings to show the hectoring that uh, Senator Specter was doing of the witness, and to say, were you as angry as I was at the way this was handled? You know, were you as angry as I was at the process? And men as well as women were, because it, w it was a sense, as I say, that this is not the way we want our government to conduct business. Uh, Barbara Boxer, Dianne Feinstein both ran for nomination in California, as you know, um, in, a, in something that people at once time thought was impossible. They both have been nominated. And what is significant is that each of them could have won without a single woman's vote. In the case of Dianne Feinstein, she received an absolute majority of the male votes. In the case of Barbara Boxer, who was in a three-way race, she received a plurality. And I think this point has to be made. Because I don't want anyone here to think we're up here just saying, please support women because they're women. We are here because we feel there are well-qualified, well talented women whose talents are needed in government and who have been denied in the past equal access to resources and support from their parties and from the community because of mythology and because they didn't feel that they could get the support to take the risks that are involved. And believe me, they are real. And often the humiliation and the personal agonies and the burden to your family of standing forth. 1992, the atmosphere has changed. And if I'm to say what's going to happen and whether we're going to be standing in November 4th and saying we did it, well, you know, I've been through it. I know it's a long way from August to November, having done it twice and not quite made it. In the case of my 82 race, uh, lost by less than 1%. Um, and I know, and I appeal to all of you, if you really care about any candidate and certainly a woman candidate, don't wake up the day after and say, gee, I just wish I had written that check. Gee, I wish I had done something. You know, it's a little late on the day after. What will happen? Well, I am bold enough to say that we will at least double the number of women in the United States Senate. <laughs> wait, 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 folks. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's just going from two to four. Give me a break here. I hope we do better than that. <laughs> but I would say as a minimum, I would love to see us elect at least five. We, um, uh, as, you, as some of you know, we, we still have a, a, some 20 women running for the U.S. Senate. Seven have been nominated. But I would certainly say we will have a dozen who will be quite viable. Um, and in the House, another dramatic figure. We will increase the number of women in the House by 50%. Well, you see, now you're catching on. There are, <laughs> there are 28 voting members of the United States House. I would say 
we would add at least 15. Again, I would hope we'd do better than that. But you know, even though I'm making a little bit of a joke of this, I want to emphasize to you that these are giant steps compared to what we've done in the past. That very often we have been praying we would add one in balance, uh, uh, add additional member of the House. You only have two in the Senate. There have been many election cycles, obviously, when we haven't added one person as to the United States Senate. We still have um, 152 women running for the U.S. House. And again, that will boil down somewhat in the number of nominees. But I fully expect we will have a record number of nominees for both the House and the Senate. The previous record was 70 running for the House and 10 for the Senate. We will exceed that. But what's important, because I don't want to get bogged down in numbers, it's not who's running. It's how many are in winnable races at a time when there is a political climate which makes it possible for them to win and where there are the resources available so they can do it. And I think that is the big difference in 1992. The factors which I uh, in, uh, recited at the beginning, the change in the agenda so that uh, even though women are good on all issues, the a propensity of voters to see them as especially good, and indeed where their record is often bid out of necessity on health care and, and child care and education and economic bread and butter issues. These are things that are the focus of voters. The fact that people do want change, the fact that there is more opportunity and there are changes which create openings, and the fact that there is terrific mobilization and energy of a vote that is there to support them. These do make this a different election cycle. What I am hoping is it's not just this cycle, but that it's part of a momentum that is building in the 90s. You know, the other question which everyone has a right to ask is what difference will it make? And I'd like to wind up with this before we go into questions. I wouldn't be putting this much time and energy running around the country and commuting every week from my home in St. Louis to work all week in Washington if I didn't really believe that it's more than just changing the, the sex uh, designation of who's in office. There was an excellent study done by the Center for the American Woman in Politics, just this last winter released, which uh, surveyed legislators, both men and women legislators, to see really how had they performed. Was there a difference? There are two points that I think are significant. One, yes, across party and ideological lines, by and large, the women legislators did include either as their top or one of their top priorities issues related to people. Very often, something was particularly important for women's lives, but for families generally. It was a top priority, and it got their top attention, and that's important in this country. But the second thing I think is even more important. They brought a more collaborative, problem-solving style. They were more likely to get out from behind the podium and say, how can we work things out together? How can we bring more people in to find a solution? I like to cite very often, and did at the press conference, this wonderful study, perfectly legitimate, by an anthropologist named Jack Weatherford, J, J. McF McIver Weatherford, I think it actually is, who uh, literally studied Congress for a full year. He, sp he had studied tribes all over the world. It's a book. <laughs> Absolutely. The book is called Tribes on the Hill. I recommend it to you. And any of you who have spent time in the state capitol, and certainly in Washington, know how much time is spent avoiding any kind of personal interchange. In other words, the honorable gentleman from so-and-so, uh, the person from this district. You never use personal names. And, and clearly, a lot of this was to keep the men from getting at one another's throats. And how much time is spent on title, and who is chair of this, and you create more and more subcommittees so everyone can be a chair of somebody. Everyone's after it for the credit, the ritual. I mean, just think of all your Masonic orders, ritual, all this kind of stuff, hierarchy. Well. He spent this time, and he said, and I want to say this respectfully, respectfully to the men here, his conclusion was that men left to themselves will engage in endless ceremonial acts. <laughs> and, and that having watched the women, the hardworking women outnumbered in Congress, desperately saying, can we just get down to get something done here, you know, spending their time researching and everything like that. He concluded, and I quote him, that the best way to get Congress to get something done was to elect more women. 
So I want to say to you that in, in great seriousness, I certainly know that there are marvelous men, elected officials we have who have been leaders and who also dedicate themselves to a collaborative problem-solving style. But I, I think we have an opportunity in this year to broaden that base, to add, to leaven the mass, to at a time when we are so involved in deadlocked and dithering and who gets the credit, you know, the president can say, well, I gave them my health policy, why didn't they pass it? And Congress will say, well, I, we gave them ours, and he, why didn't he pass it? And this party says this, and this, that, and this chairman says this, and this one says that, and everyone's trying to get the credit and, you know, all that kind of thing. People really are fed up. And I do think that they are right instinctively in seeing that women who have often been motivated to go into public office because of some problem they want to solve will indeed uh, use this occasion and this opportunity to do it. And so I'd like to close with uh, an excerpt from a letter that I received that I think had a lot to do with how I've approached what I'm doing now. It's very easy to get caught up yourself in the ego, in the interviews, and in the credits, and how many elections. And this is a, 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 from a dear friend of mine who is a social worker, and I quote, despite long years of work in social welfare, only the past three have fully awakened me to the dreadful condition of the female underclass of our country, to the waitresses, service station clerks, hospital aides, fast food workers, so many single mothers without marketable skills, most lacking health insurance, without adequate child care resources, typically unassisted by absent fathers of their children. Their lives are an unending drudgery of debt, guilt, loneliness, poverty, and hopelessness. What assistance government provides is merely for survival, nothing for advancement or escape. Your caucus must do what it can to bring in women to government with awareness and indignation to seek change. Thank you very much. President, fellow City Club members, if the lady from Missouri will yield to me for a moment, <laughs> I would like to have the floor for a quick question. Um, I, I think the uh, polls and the conventional wisdom and all the other indicators say that uh, a lot of women will be elected this year, and uh, maybe your, your goals are not uh, optimistic enough. Um, are they going to be winning, are women going to be winning elections because of the advantages of being women this year? Because they're obviously by definition not part of the old boy network. They're not, uh, uh, you know, the incumbents and perhaps they have a, uh, are enjoying a better reputation right now. Uh, are we now at the point or will we soon be at the point where the electorate will look at women uh, on their own merits and uh, picking women as, uh, as the successful candidate um, regardless of their sex, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, may the day come soon. <laughs> I, I think we all would like, in a sense, to go out of business as um, an advocacy group where we put all our resources primarily toward women. We'd like to go out of business because we're so successful that there are always um, sufficient diversity of women candidates. Uh, I think, as I've indicated, we don't believe that you should be electing women just because they're women. And we don't think women should or will be elected just because they're women. I've often said, if anyone thinks they're going to elect it by getting, standing up there and saying, remember Anita Hill or something, I mean, that's nonsense. The candidates, in fact, the candidates I introduced here earlier, uh, and you know them better than I, Elizabeth First and Vera Katz, clearly wouldn't be running for the major office they are and, and, and have the credibility if they had not put in the time and the effort and proved themselves in their, in their fields. And I'm sorry I can't mention even more because you have so many legislative candidates. Uh, so I guess the, the answer to you is um, we're going to stay in business and we're going to um, focus nationally at the Women's Political Caucus, put all our resources on finding well-qualified women, and we'll take the criticism of people say that that is discriminatory until we reach a situation in this country where women are not uh, prevented from uh, access 
on an equal basis as men. But may the day come that it's otherwise. And, and may I just say as an addendum, because you are quite close to the state of Washington, I wrote a letter to the uh, Democratic Platform Committee, which I said, never mind the checklist of issues, folks. Uh, we know you're good on family leave and pay equity and all those things. The issue for this party is when are you going to start nominating more women for office? When, are you going to ha when am I going to see them inside the campaign structure in key positions? When are they really going to share power? When are they in many more of the cabinet positions? Because you can do far more about that as party leaders than simply endorsing policies which eventually will have to be carried out by in legislatures. Uh, and I cited the case of Patty Murray because for me, this was a case where she had, with some courage as a state senator, uh, decided to file against uh, an incumbent senator of her own party. He withdrew, and the immediate reaction was, can't we find a man for this job? It wasn't, can we find a way, if she seems qualified, is she someone we can work with that will allow us to add another woman to the Senate? It was this immediate barrier that is created, and I feel that um, the assumption that somehow she would be less qualified even if some other man came, uh, some man came along who probably was not as well qualified. In my case in 82, when I had been a state senator, uh, all those things you heard mentioned about me, and when I finally stepped forward to be a nominee, they said, you're nothing but a suburban housewife. We have a bank lobbyist to run for that position of the United States Senate. He can get money. But too much of that's still on. So when you say, I hope we go out of business because the barriers, artificial barriers, will not be there, and women will have to win on their merits because I think that's the way they're winning now. Yes. Gretchen Beener from the Government and Taxation Committee. We're all now well aware of the impact that the Anita Hill ha hearings had on the primaries this spring and probably the impact on the tailhook scandal which is now being addressed in Congress. Could you please respond on how you think the impact will continue in the future? And specifically, would the tailhook affair have been shuffed, shuffed under the, shuffled under the rug as so many others have been in the past, but for the Anita, Anita Hill issue? That's a really good question because I think absolutely. In fact, what you saw with the backlash, if you will, that occurred on the Hill-Thomas hearings, that a lot of the senators were really snake bit. They don't, you know, some of them still don't get it. I want you to know that. Uh, the caucus, uh, I initiated a series of private lunches, which have not been publicized, with individual members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and leaders of mainstream women's groups. I'm talking about League of Women Voters, BPW, AUW, National Council of Black uh, Negro Business and Professional Women, and MANA, you know, all these groups, because this myth existed that somehow women really weren't upset. It was just, you know, these radical feminists who were upset. And I wanted them to understand that there really was frustration, not just on the issue of abortion rights, but on uh, the whole sense of being. Uh, of public policy which was not supportive of working women and were women in the home. So I'm going to say to you that the, after those lunches with Simpson and Specter and Deaconcini and I, I don't know God. Anyway, <laughs> I, I will just tell you, um, I'm not sure they still get it, but the fact is that the impact was, as you know, uh, <coughs> that um, the Civil Rights Act <coughs> went through Congress, even though women's uh, be, uh, rights to, for redress were capped, that would never have passed. It was like they said, oh my goodness, we got to do something for those women. They're furious with us. And uh, they, they passed that. Of course, even some of the, uh, our advocates who should have gone for a stronger bill bailed out on the, the version that the, the women in Congress were trying to get and said, we've got to settle for, for something less, promising that we would have, and now we have the Equal Remedies Act to try to restore equity in terms of redress for women. But that wouldn't have happened. Uh, the he said, she said trials, the uh, tail, I'm sure would not have gotten the attention. The bottom line though is what ultimately is really going to happen? And is this, is this being treated as a temporary phenomena, you know, kind of we can just get them off our backs? Or is there going to be permanent change. I see both things. I think in some cases you're having really serious attempts to look at sexual harassment or at least 
understanding one another better, men and women within organizations, and particularly within government organizations, and that's a, a definite benefit. But in terms of really sharing power, that's always a little hard for the guys to learn how to do, okay? <laughs> yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Woods. Naomi Menken, City Club member. I haven't done an exact head count here, but I dare say that where most meetings, the majority in attendance are men, uh, I don't have to count to know today the majority of attendees know? are women. And I'd just like to have you comment on that factor. I, Thank I, you. I think that's a, uh, well, you've really done that already. Uh, <laughs> and I will let the men take the praise who are here and those who are absent, perhaps listening, <laughs> accept uh, the challenge to them, which is, uh, almost a follow-up to the previous question. Do they consider themselves with some responsibility for uh, remedying some of the injustices of our society and understanding more about what's happening, or do they think it's women's job to take care of themselves, which is a very sad commentary. Yes? Electing new women to office is a good and pragmatic goal, but what about retaining first-term women, especially first-term minority women? whose incumbency is fragile. A small effect there could have a much larger effect by retaining successful women in office. What does the NWPC plan to help first-term women and first-term minority women, uh, specifically such as Representative Ileana ross Leitner? Okay, well, uh, you picked uh, uh, an unfortunate one for us there because uh, she is not pro-choice. We are supporting um, a couple of uh, Hispanic women we hope will join Congress. You're correct, she is the only Hispanic woman there now. However, what we are doing, and it's an excellent point you're raising, because if you don't retain those who are there, you're gonna go backwards. Um, so uh, we are currently, for example, putting a great deal of effort, Barbara Rose Collins in Michigan, who is a black woman uh, who is, uh, has a rather testy race for, um, in, in Michigan. Um, we have uh, several others I could name uh, we have committed to max out for all incumbents because we want to be sure they stay there. Uh, in terms of women of color, we have special initiatives. Not only do we have proudly an affirmative action within our organization where at least three out of the five vice presidents must be women of color, but uh, we do special trainings for Latina women. We do special trainings for women of color. And as I said, our first vice president is Anita Perez Ferguson, who is running for Congress in California, Hispanic woman, and we hope very much will be elected. Um, uh, so I, I, I would say you, you are absolutely right. Otherwise, we'd, it would be just like a revolving door. Yes? Good afternoon. I'm Penny Kennedy and a longtime member of the caucus. And uh, we're very pleased, of course, with the inroads that we have made in Oregon and changing the uh, face of Oregon politics. Um, what I wondered if you would be so kind as to invite the uh, candidates who are here, women candidates Love who are here, to, to stand it, you know, up and, and be and recognized. Really, it's embarrassing that I didn't do that. I seem to single out a couple of the prominent ones. I think it would be wonderful if all the women who are candidates for office in this room would rise. Could I? And I, I just want to say, since um, you know, I would like those of you who are interested to come up to these women and offer your assistance. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Yes. As you mentioned, it takes a lot of credibility and experience to run for a major office like Senate. Uh, senator and our governor. Could you talk about the pipeline issue that you see in the different states? Yeah, I think that um, we feel very strongly in the caucus that you have to start women out to even believe that it's worthwhile or possible to be involved. Indeed, even before we're, we have trainings, which I think we are the uh, leaders in trainings for women campaign workers in office. We've initiated two other programs as a result of this year. One is with a major corporation, McDonnell Douglas, uh, which um, is aimed at, and we did focus groups at women business executives and men, men business executives to see what the difference in their attitude was toward political involvement. Because we really feel that part of our problem is a lot of women never even get to a training or never even 
think about writing a check or never even become involved. They, they think their lives are too occupied to give any time to politics and don't see that there is advantage to them, career, personal, and public policy. And, and you'd be interested to know, because it is relevant to the pipeline, that whereas the, both men and women's general view of politics was one of general kind of yuck, you know, dirty stuff, I don't want to take my time for it, that the men, when, when sort of challenged, well, if you wanted to get involved, let's say you chose to what you do, they were sort of like, well, I'd go see Jimmy Carter. Or, you know, I mean, it was, I, you know, it was like, I know what to do, or I, I would go and do it. I would, um, I would connect with someone, or I would step forward. The women, it was almost as, I'd have to get permission from somebody. It was sort of like, I'm not sure the corporation would really like it, or I'm not sure I'd know how to go about it, or there was a, clearly a barrier there in terms of their perception of um, their either their right or their willingness or their ability to step forward. We are doing a similar uh, program now through the Coalition Labor Union to determine the same thing with the, you know, the hourly wage people to see what the barriers are. Once we can help break through that to uh, find out and to get a training model to uh, encourage women to say, no matter how busy my life is, that there is a reason why the men end up in the boardroom and I don't, and very often it's because they get mentored into making the connections which are essentially political. It's the same kind of training. And the women who are working so hard to become partner or to you know, get up and everything, and they're doing all those good jobs, and then they they're, have their private life and everything else, and then they see this other person's there and they say, oh, I've been discriminated against. But if you talk to the CEO, he's saying, well, this person's more valuable to me, you know? And I think that there are some learning experiences. But as to the training itself, real briefly, the, the Oregon a Political Caucus, local and state, conducts trainings, and the National Political Caucus holds about 10 national regional trainings, which are designed to help women look at what it would mean to either run for office or to help someone to learn how you would make that decision. How would you put together a campaign plan? How would you, you know, raise money? How would you use media to see themselves on, you know, giving a speech? To uh, have this done by uh, skilled trainers, both parties, women of color, of diversity of people so we can attract all sorts of audience. And then to get them started, uh, it could be school board, city council, it could be appointment to a local commission, it could be building a game plan where you say I'm going to run five years from now and I better start by, learning, by locating in a community where I have some chance ever to get elected because it's the same party I am. Uh, and I ought to begin to go to some of the meetings in the community or I ought to become expert on something. You know, all this resource development. So what we do, which is unlike some of the better known uh, funding groups, is we don't wait until they're already running for Congress. We try to get them started in the pipeline so that when an opportunity exists, that woman will have had some credentials and will already have held a local office. Is there another question? Yes. Uh, will Reed, City Club member. Uh, with Ross Perot dropping out of the race, we are uh, led by the press to presume that there are only two choices, and yet uh, there, are, there is a woman running for president as an independent, and there is a party that has Libertarian Party has a woman as vice president. Uh, my question to you is how invested are you and maybe how invested should you be in the two-party system? Well, we are change? multipartisan. May I make it very clear by our bylaws. We are not, although we often say bipartisan because basically mostly we work through the two parties, we are multipartisan and we would endorse a qualified woman who met our standards in whatever as long as she goes through the process. I want to say something to you, though. If, before the Democratic Convention, I feel that women were really hanging back, and they uh, felt that George Bush had written them off, and I believe because the party, his party, um, the Republican Party, had decided it was going to be a three-way race, and they, were, they went for this locking in the more right wing of the party, which really meant driving away a lot of the swing vote of women. Um, so it really boiled down to women saying, well, Clinton says a lot of the right things. He checklists everything, but I don't feel any, you know, I still don't feel an emotional commitment to him. And looking at Ross Perot and saying, God, you know, it sort of excites me that he's direct. And, and when they said, are you pro-choice? He said, sure, it's a woman's right. And, you know, there he was, this sort of macho Texas man, you know, you know how we all feel about macho Texas men, you know, <laughs> after the Ann Richards race. 
with uh, Clytie. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that it was really up in the air. I want to say to you that there was a watershed event that occurred at the Democratic Convention, and we're very, very proud that uh, uh, we helped make a connection, not because we're trying to help Bill Clinton, but because we made a point at that convention that women should stop being a sideshow and they should be showcased and treated as full power partners by that party. And we insisted that Bill Clinton, if he was going to come to speak to women, not appear as so often happens at the last day, coming, you know, here I am, your nominee, now will all you handmaidens go out and elect me? <laughs> it was going to be, uh, he would, we really worked hard using connections with strong women in the campaign, the party, and those of us outside to say, he must come on the day when we have all the top women Senate and House candidates there and we are showcasing them and he must come and acknowledge that women themselves are powerful political figures and that he is going to share his power and acknowledge that. And I want to give him credit. He not only showed up, but when I introduced him saying that I felt this was an unusual situation, he whoever, if, whether he wrote the speech or whether someone else did, he delivered it in lines that are still being quoted by previously cynical New York women leaders, <laughs> which was, you know, I am the grandson of a working woman. I am the son of a woman who uh, was a, had to raise her children on her own. I am the husband of a woman who built a career and who earns 10 times as much as I do. And I'm the father of, of, a, of a daughter who wants to grow up and be a space engineer. And he said, I understand that you can build women up without tearing men down. And I want to say to you, there were chills in that room because they felt he gets it. He gets it. And he, uh, in his acceptance speech, when he said she instead of he, when referring to a child being born, I mean, there was just all sorts of signals that went out. So what I want to say is that I really feel that he has gone a long way to not just being treating women as a special interest who have to, whose votes have to be getting, but to energize uh, the women's vote, which will be turning out for women's can women candidates. And if you think of California, Pennsylvania, Illinois, New York, where there are very likely to be the first rank of women Senate candidates, and think of those electoral votes, and to think of all those women turning out to help those women candidates, the challenge very well may be who can get that vote <laughs> to vote for a president. And I think it's a real challenge to George Bush. Um, we are going to the Republican convention, trying to get them to showcase their candidates. As for the third party, and you raise a legitimate in, uh, question, I would simply say to you that I don't get much of a read that there is a, um, a drive either to have a lot of women candidates as such by any other party. There is, you're correct, a, a woman who is the nominee for another party, or to really to reach out in the same way and make that contact. Therefore, realistically, when we are talking about helping women candidates, we are, by and large, there's one independent, I think, running for, for or two independents for the House. We are, by and large, dealing with those who have been nominated through the party system. So I just want to answer it. Yes. Uh, Helen Lee, a member of the club. Uh, my reaction to the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas uh, debacle last year was that I couldn't wait to get to the polls and vote this year. But I'm concerned that it further confirmed the disaffection, particularly among many young voters. And I'm wondering how we can good make point. them believe that they can make a difference. I think it's a good point to reach before we wind up here is that, because I think the real question is, what are we passing on to the next generation and how inspired will they be? I'm very pleased that spontaneously we've had a young women's caucus um, rise within our caucus, I mean it's sort of internal. We held a training just for young women, college women, others around the country for the first time the caucus did to train them to work in campaigns because we very often find, and I'm sure you know this is true, if you get involved in a campaign, if you get involved with a candidate, that's what really hooks you and you begin to see, and even if it's years later after your college career and your career gets started, you know, you remember that and you stay affiliated. We had almost 400, we were planning for 200, we had 400 young women, many of them from 20 different states in this country, who showed up for some really excellent, top 
consultants and pollsters and, and field directors on how you work in a campaign, ending with a, a um, you might say, a job fair from 15 campaigns to hook them in either to paid or volunteer jobs, and we're continuing to involve them, and we're reaching out to campuses. I think that this generation is turning around a little more, maybe because their expectations, sadly, are different than the previous generation, which thought there was a, you know, a pot at the end of the golden rainbow, and, or a golden pot at the end of whatever that is. Anyway, <laughs> I think, the, and sadly, the expectations of this generation is that they'll be lucky to get a decent job. And I think we're returning to a notion of public service and responsibility, and I think that's excellent because really isn't that what getting elected to office is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Harriet, we thank you very much on behalf of the City Club for coming to Portland and sharing your remarks with us. This political process is one that City Club has always taken an avid interest in. And thank you very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>